Welcome to the Women in Vinyl podcast with Jen DiEugenio, founder of Women in Vinyl and contributor Robin Raymond. This podcast facilitates conversations with those working in the vinyl record industry to educate, demystify, and diversify the vinyl community. On this episode, we're coming back around to the process of actually pressing your record, and we have a unicorn with us today, a female press-op, Brianna Orozco of Memphis Record Pressing in Tennessee. Thank you for joining us. Da, 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 da. Do you feel like you need a cape after that? I have a cape, and I yeah. want it <laughs> A lasso of truth and a cape? I'm here for it. Let's do it. <laughs> Oh yeah, and I, I do it all week, every single day of my life, so. And for how long? Um, well, I guess like three years or so, because I've been with the company for almost six, but I've done everything from quality control to packaging yeah. to inspecting the records and like all that. I've done everything pretty much, but. That's awesome. I didn't know you were there that long. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. incredible been there for a while I've seen them go from the ground <laughs> up it's been an awesome experience oh that's so good I mean it's it's kind of a, a love or hate kind of scenario at a pressing plant so oh yeah I mean I love it I hate it sometimes but I love hating it so I just <laughs> <laughs> it's like a black hole and I can't get away I mean, that's the Bukowski in all of us, right? Like yeah. find something that you love and let it kill you because that's, that's what all of this is all about. I love that. I die every day, but it's fine. It keeps me alive somehow. They're just little deaths. It's fine. I love it. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> so how did you find your way there? Uh, it was all word of mouth back then. And my brother had a friend that had a job there and he started working there and then he got myself and my boyfriend hired on and then we just haven't left since but it was so small they literally had like 20 employees at the time and now they have hundreds <laughs> but and when you joined up where did you start uh, I started in packaging so I was okay. actually an assembler so we would put them in the jackets and stuff shrink wrap them box them ship them out and then from there I moved to an inspector so that's and we're starting to stop doing this because I think we're the only plant that sleeves records hot off the press. But that's what we do. We literally pull them from the press, check for defects, put them in the sleeves, and then they get sent to a different department to get put together. But I've done all of that. <laughs> yeah, I think Precision still does that too, though. And I mean, like, you guys are kind of under the same umbrella, mm -hmm. Ella, 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 anyway, hey, so... Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so it wouldn't surprise me that you know you'd have like similar uh processes yes yes yeah that's yeah. what i hear i've never been there and i really want to but maybe yeah we'll it's it's something i worked there for a hot minute at the beginning of last year uh for like eight eight weeks i think and then i just got too busy with cutting and then the pan pan demi lovato started so i was like <laughs> see you later <laughs> Hey, <laughs> I'm gonna go work by myself and not in a factory where there's a whole bunch of humans. Yeah, people, yeah. people are strange. Had yeah. you wanted to do pressing, or were you, you know, just sort of down to do whatever, or were you like working like that's what I want to do? Uh, kind of both, because as an inspector and my boyfriend being a press operator at the time, I just always liked to help out anywhere. So he would say like, "Hey, go do this for me," and I'd start doing it. And then we start expanding and we get more people. And I was like, well, I want to do that. 
Yeah. <laughs> I think I was one of the first female press operators at our plant. And that was exciting. And then everybody- and how many do you guys have now? Um, one, two, uh, only three actually right now. At one point we had like four, um, oh. but really it's just three now. It's still amazing. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. How many it. presses do you guys have? Uh, okay, so we have, technically we have 15 right now. Oh, wow. uh, we've got one of our older style SMTs. We've got 12 automatic GZ presses, and then we have two manual presses. Wow. Oh, nice. wow. I didn't know that, that, that you're more on the auto side than on the manual side. That's... Oh, yeah. We're primarily oh, okay. auto. Oh, cool. And we're about to get a lot more. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, yeah. They're That's planning. Exciting. Yeah, they're about to expand so much. Like we're about to build a whole new building that can hold even more machines. So they're, I think they're shooting for like 52 machines. Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Machi, machi. Oh, yeah. machi. So <laughs> yeah, everybody machi. out there, if you're angling to get into Tennessee, I have hey. a feeling that hey, there's gonna be I'm, some job openings. <laughs> I love Memphis. But yeah, tell Katrina if she wants those jobs posted, send them our way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you guys are going to need all kinds of people. You're going to need people for pressing and for QA and mm -hmm. for all of those Everything. things. Yeah. No, that's cool. Even eventually our packaging, like where we are now, we have like three buildings. So we've got hmm. like one for storage, one for packaging, and one for our main production. But we're eventually, very soon, going to have packaging and assembly off-site, like a half a mile away. Because oh, wow. we just don't have enough space for everything that we're doing. Because yeah. we are, business is popping right now. <laughs> I mean, it's so true. It is so true. Are you guys at, are you guys two shifts or three shifts there? Three shifts. Man, yeah. those presses never get a break then. <laughs> they get a break on the weekend sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> They're fine. They have no feelings. <laughs> they don't really. We do name them though. Yeah. But oh yeah. They don't really like breaks. They don't really like it because if we stop it and start it back up, it yeah. It takes it's... a whole. It's got to warm back up. It's like foreplay. It's too much. It's just too much. <laughs> so who is your favorite press? What's its name? Yeah. What's her name? <laughs> well, I wouldn't say it's my favorite, but I've named this one Susan because they all act out like women. So I've given yeah. them all female names. Um, <laughs> yeah, she's problematic, that's Susan. I mean, it makes it easier when you've got something to cuss at with a name, oh, yeah. right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Know. Like you can't just be like, darn you, number four. <laughs> yeah. There's uh, one of my coworkers, he always threatens to eat their babies. It's, oh. <laughs> it's like, I'll eat your babies. <laughs> A hot plastic baby. Hot <laughs> plastic. Hot probably, plastic. Probably that should be a band name. Hot plastic babies. That's a good one. <laughs> That's the women in vinyl cover band. <laughs> I'll be the backup dancer. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. We do we do Sabbath and Rollins band covers, and that's yeah. it. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> oh, so, you've done all the things at Memphis, but what does your day in the life look like now, Brianna? Well, now I'm actually a supervisor. Oh, she's a boss. <laughs> I'm getting on up there, but oh, yeah. I do still, I'm very hands-on and I, I don't really want to go up anymore because I like being in the machines and being hands-on in the process. Yeah. So, honestly, Not getting lost in the paperwork. Oh yeah. And the paperwork is paperwork tremendous it's, it's tremendous but i've been doing it for so long i could do it with my eyes closed oh, okay. <laughs> but we basically we have our schedule you know yep. tells us everything that's running on all of our machines so we make sure that because we've got our stampers we've got the labels we've got to make sure we've got the right sleeves so i make sure that everybody has what they need for that particular job yep. and that's pretty much it. And what's crazy to me is, is even if all we do is put a different job on the press, depending on how the grooves are cut, changes how the machine runs. Like you could, because you know, records weigh usually like 180 or 140 grams. And usually, 
Really? We say ish. Yeah, we say ish. ish. We're trying our best. <laughs> you know, you ain't weighing every single record that comes off of that thing. You not, know it. Not everyone, but we do have to check them twice an hour. So we we have so, so like much- once every fifty. Sometimes, you know, if somebody's writing something down sometime, we're good. But it's it's really cool how the stampers can affect the press that much. Like depending on how deep the grooves are cut or how many songs are on it, like all of that affects how the press runs. And that's what blows my mind. So I'm sitting here breaking it down like, okay, so this is classical music. So those those grooves are gonna be pretty shallow. So we're gonna have to change these settings to make this work right because we have defects that come out and we have to fix it and it's just really fun so we have a process so when we get an order and somebody wants to press something with us we have Mm -hmm. them get some stampers cut with the music Mm -hmm. on it and we sit they send some to us and we do it's called a test press and we put our our fancy test press labels with the sign on it you know i've (laughs) seen them once or twice yeah (laughs) and uh we've got there's like a group of people who listen to it all the way through, listen for any defects and say that this sounds good. And then they send it off and mm-hmm. the client will say, okay, well, that sounds good. We're going to send you all the media. We're going to send you everything. And then we get, they've got their catalog number. And then we've got our own number for each job. We call it our MRP number. And each MRP number has the client's catalog number. And we have to cross like, look at everything together and what our QC does when we get the job running, they listen to the songs, they check the labels, they make sure everything checks out. And we don't really have a good fail safe if we can't figure it out. Like a lot of our guys check Discogs and sometimes we do check Spotify, but if it's a new release, we're like, well, this sounds right. So we're going to go with it. (laughs) You said like, this is classical music. So like you were um, trying to figure out what the settings and stuff were going to be mm-hmm. on the machine. So you were like, you're like, oh, we've, we've already listened to that one. And it's like written down on your production sheet. So you're like, this is classical. So like, watch out for X, Y, Z. Yes. Cool. And that okay. it really just depends. Cause we have certain issues that tend to happen with certain types of music. I want to tell you that hip hop and metal is pretty much indestructible. Amen. Like, no matter how <laughs> we press it, it just always sounds good. Mm -hmm. and like classical music it's really prone to stuff like stitching and that's just a a certain type of defect that can cause it to make like a ripping sound when it crosses over um what else and how does stitching typically happen from a pressing perspective is it too hot or too cold it's typically too cold so we've got our hydraulic system so you've got a stamper on top stamper on bottom it squishes So if the material, the vinyl, if it's too cold, when it separates, there's literally pieces of vinyl getting stuck to the stamper and ripping from the record. So you've got these little gaps in the grooves. Because if you look at it under a microscope, it just looks like somebody chiseled away at it. So we make it a little hotter and that opens up smoother and then we get a good sounding record. Yeah, I think, you know, we've talked about QC a little bit and I think it's just really interesting to sort of understand how some of those things work, you know, so maybe take our listeners through just how the actual press works, like how you set it up for a job and run it through. Okay. So we press a lot of vinyl in a lot of different colors. So Mm -hmm. we first have to make sure that if the client wants this press in a certain color, we have the color. So we've got what we call a hopper. It's full of the compound. So vinyl sometimes it's tpc sometimes it's this nacan brand but little plastic beads and then we've got a barrel with a big old screw in the middle there's heating bands all throughout it so as the screw moves it heats up those little beads of material and we've got this little cup and it material fills up in there once it's nice and hot and the way our our rgz presses operate the autos you've got little canisters that hold the label. So you've got, we normally do like if it's a single LP, we've got the B side on top, A side on bottom. So we've got a little label arm, picks up the labels, labels go in, you've got a puck. So you've basically just got this little hockey puck shaped thing with labels on it. And then you've got the stampers on the machine, squishes, and there's all this excess stuff around the edge of it. Once it's done pressing, we call it flash. 
and then <laughs> that gets cut off and then you have a record. And what we do, my operators are really good about checking for defects before whoever's going to assemble them or inspect them. So they are aware of if this looks like a good record or if they have to change the settings. Because a lot of times you don't have to change anything. Looks great, sounds great, no big deal. But with different colors, you've got clear colors, you've got opaque colors, we've got crazy blends. So sometimes we have to drastically change our settings. So you've got a preheat and steam. So the steam is what's hot. That's what's gonna make all the stuff squish out, make it look like a record. And then in order to cool it, we've got water that's cold. So that hardens it and makes it not just a floppy mess. So we just have to look at what comes off and adjust accordingly. And a lot of times I literally just feel it like, okay, well, this looks good, but there's some of this, it's a little too hot. We're going to cool it down a little bit. Yeah. And it's just a process and just hit or miss. And a lot of times the time of day can affect how the presses run. The presses like to run in the cold. Yeah, I mean, and being in Memphis, like it's not oh. not uh, a really a <laughs> yeah. really cold place all the time. <laughs> so uh, speaking that I'm from Canada, so <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I I've never been to Memphis. I've never been to Tennessee. So it's like it's... Satan's asshole. It's hot and it's humid <laughs> and it's just so sticky. That's the T-shirt for the episode. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> No. Oh my God, why would you ever apologize for cheap, <laughs> cheap commentary like that? Please don't. Right, it's cool. amazing. Cool. But yeah, it's, we, ha we have the- why, why, did, why do you think they like operating in the cold better than in the, the middle of Satan's butt? You know, I haven't quite figured it out. Um, I think it has a lot to do with our infrastructure, <laughs> which is what they're working on now. Because right. a lot of these really- they're in places that have been around a lot longer they have really great climate control and we're just now at a point where we can tighten all that up and have a good uh like cooling system inside so it's not super hot but we're we're a super small building and right. they've been around for a while just trying to get to this point and we're we get better and better every day <laughs> so i mean that's all that's all you can ask for really like it's it's all of these steps and processes are very variable throughout all of the all of the steps like it's i mean the outside climate affects the way that things happen inside of a building like even in my studio like my cutting room right now is like 95 degrees that i'm standing yeah. in for hours and hours and hours and i'm just like oh my god like I keep trying to figure out what the humidity and temperature mm -hmm. does for my processing, even just like cutting records. Yeah. And I, and I find that, yeah, like my machine likes it when it's cold, mm -hmm. but the room is warm. So it's kind of like a, like the record has to be hot in order for me to cut good, Yep. but the room needs to be cold in order for the machine to work well. So exactly. it's, it's a double-edged sword. Yeah. It's a completely the most ridiculous thing that yep. you could ever imagine trying to manage. So my oh, heart is with you it. on that one, for sure. <laughs> yeah, the pain is real some days. It's totally true. <laughs> I mean, and I don't even have to wear steel toes anymore. So I feel like <laughs> You did mention uh, color. How do you notice a difference between color and black? And what are some colors that are maybe harder to press than others? Yes. Okay, clear <laughs> colors are the worst clear colors are awful like worst to... for what like for pressing for errors for defects for sound everything not oh. so much not so much sound but because mm -hmm. because of how the compound is yep you have to it runs a lot hotter in order for it to make a proper puck because mm -hmm. pucks have to be a certain shape in order to run properly in the press so if it's not if the material is not hot enough it looks kind of stringy and mm -hmm. it, the pellets don't get melted down completely so we have to crank the temps up to basically turn it to soup and by doing that the cycle time on the press has to be longer because you have to run the steam for longer and then you have to have a longer cooling time for it to cool properly so you don't have anything like weird heating or cooling defects but mm -hmm. Clear colors, if you can get the settings dialed in, sound amazing. I want to say the colors that I don't like pressing because they always sound like garbage 
are yeah. colors like glow in the dark or yeah. colors with glitter in them because it's just I mean, if yeah. you think about how a record is playing, all of those things just affect the sound of it and it gives it a really high noise floor. But like, I love black. I love black. If we could just press black records all day, I'd be so happy. But <laughs> we were we were just talking about that. I was literally <laughs> just saying that where I was like, I wonder when there's going to be a plant that just says you can have any color you want as long as it's black. <laughs> no, the people don't want it. But I do know these that- people do these these <laughs> yeah. people these people, people do yeah I mean because I know yeah. eventually they have a plan MRP does when we have our second building we're gonna have one building for just black records and our other building will be for all colored records and I want to be on the black side so another thing about ways that you know we can press records we have the PVC compound like you mentioned. But I think that there is um, a lot of discussion around regrind. I think a lot of uh, people that collect records maybe think that it's inferior product. How do, do you guys use regrind? Talk to us, uh, you know, a little bit about that. Constantly. We, yeah. We've actually done a couple of jobs where the client or the band has actually asked us to only use regrind because we're use, reusing our resources. They have they use recycled paper for their labels and their jackets and stuff. But mm -hmm. I have no issue with regrind. It it doesn't really run any differently because a lot of colors we run, if we don't get a shipment in time, we can grind some up, get the ball rolling, and use it no problem. The totally. only thing that might happen is sometimes there's one really old record that got ground down. So there's one little piece of material that got crystallized and kind of scratches a stamper. So we blow through stampers a little faster. But other than that, I have no issue with it. I love yeah. using regrind and it. I like that we use it because it's resourceful because we smash a lot of plastic. That's a lot of plastic. And by reusing some of that, it, it's very conscientious and I appreciate it, but I have no negative thing to say about it, honestly. Yeah, I agree. And you can do random color mixes. I mean, mm -hmm. you can do all kinds of stuff with it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, we actually yeah. have a color blend that we just call grab bags. And it's yeah, amazing. literally just a bunch of ground up colors. Like, our color blends, if we grind them up, we can't reuse them. So yeah. we throw it in a grab bag mix. So every yeah. record looks different. And that, I think that's really cool. Yeah. I love that. I'm, I'm totally here for that. Yeah, I, I like where I work. It's a pretty cool place. They do some really <laughs> cool stuff. And they take care of their people. I mean, that's one of the biggest things about working in a factory and working in an environment like that, man. Like, it's hard to keep everybody happy and keep everybody on the on the same path, you know, mm -hmm. creating a good product and like, like, you know, still showing up because that's, that's the thing. Like what you do is so specific and so technical. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's vastly underappreciated yeah across so. across collecting and across the industry really like if you guys start to hate your jobs then we're all fucked yeah well, exactly. so, yeah it's hard <laughs> i mean it's hard work you guys are on your feet all day it's yes. you know warm you know it's not and I think, it's like a clock in clock out job like it's to the minute you've got to be productive you have to account oh, for yeah. all the pvc Balls you're using ball yeah. every day and especially yeah. now because we are growing so fast that we almost can't keep up with it. Like we're already booked up for jobs for the rest of the year into next year. And they did that in like February. Yep. So we're, <laughs> we are just, oh my gosh, it's, it's awesome. But I'm very passionate about what I do. And when I talk to people, like if I don't go out very much anymore, but anytime somebody asks me like, oh, I see your shirt, what is that? And I tell them, they're like, that's so cool. And they, I didn't know we still made records. That's the most common thing that I ever <laughs> Yes, I that's no my idea. favorite. You're like, or, well, where have you been? <laughs> or, the, or the people that are like, oh, I heard those are getting big again. And I'm like, yeah, for the last like 15 years. Like, <laughs> what? Have you been to a bar? Who are, are you, alien? <laughs> yeah, it, also that, exactly. I mean, but that's like that, that speaks that that speaks to the, the Memphis model. If you've been there for six years, I'm guessing your dude's been there for almost as long as you have or the same amount of time. So, I mean, what what are the things that keep you happy at your gig? And what what is what has made you like want to go from department to department to like now where you are and stay where you are? And you're like, I don't want to go any higher. Like, this is the jam. This is my this is my role. Like, 
So yeah, first off, the owners, Mark and Brandon, they're amazing. They are some of the greatest people I've ever known. But also just the process alone. I, I like being able to fix things myself and figure out why something's not working and fix it. I love doing that. And that's pretty much all that my job is, especially if a part breaks because my boyfriend's a maintenance man, so he can repair the machines. He can do anything if something breaks. Um, but I just like the process. I like seeing something, putting something together and making something beautiful. Like I'm literally making music at, every day at my job. And that's just really freaking cool. And I've worked, I left for like a year to work at a vet's office, but I, I had to come back. I, I loved it too much. And it's, I enjoy getting up and going to work every day. And not everybody can say that. But I love I that. Love my that makes job. me so happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. glad that you went out into the world to try something else. And you're like, nah, this is it. This is, I gotta the, go this back. is the thing. No, that's awesome. That's it's, so awesome. It's a cool place. <laughs> It's fun to go to work with your partner too. I know not everybody can say that, but I'm in the same situation and he's, uh, he, um, heads up our QC and press room and I'm in yeah. front of house. So yeah, it's fun. It's fun to like talk we, about the things. Yeah. And we get to work right next to each other and I don't know how he's not sick of me, but I'll take it because <laughs> I have to tell him to do stuff sometimes and he, he does a pretty good job. So I, I <laughs> So what is the, the process of like putting a job on? Um, can you kind of like walk us back through? I think we got to the, the, the part where you're like, you put a bunch in, of labels in the canister mm -hmm. and then the arms yeah. swing out and we do the thing. What happens after the record is actually pressed? Your press ops are like, yep, this is a good one. It, get, it goes into the stack and then what happens? So our process, we have inspectors Mm -hmm. Sorry, my dog's in my lap. Um, they, so they usually have about two presses each. So this press, this press, they have to make sure that the job that's coming off has the right labels that we did our job right as operators. They spot check it because QC listens to things all the way through. Inspectors just kind of look at what's coming off the press right now. And if they see anything weird, they'll tell the operators they check for defects, they put them in the necessary sleeve, whether it's a plain poly sleeve or if it's a custom sleeve, and then they get stacked on these big metal things that we call slant backs. So it's basically just a tall metal three walled thing on wheels. <laughs> and they put little cards on them with the job information. It gets sent over to the assembly. The records have to cool before they can get assembled. So once they get to packaging and assembly, they put them in the jackets with any insert or download card or poster, or whatever goes with that job. And then once they put that all together, they shrink wrap it, put them in a bunch of boxes and ship them out into the world. <laughs> but the process of getting a stamper on, everybody kind of does differently. But yeah. the main thing is because of how stampers are made, they've got a bunch of weird like grime on them. So we have to clean them and we have to clean the molds where the steam and water go through. Yeah. So we have to make sure that there's nothing on either side of the mold or the stamper, because if there's anything in between there, that's how you get like dimples or things that you could hear make mm -hmm. like a loud thump or anything um, or mishandling, they might scratch it. So that's what the inspectors look out for to make sure that we did a good, efficient job. But once we do that, then we start to press and then start off with that process. Are you the one checking stampers? Um, sometimes, because most of the time, like my position now, I basically just keep track of everybody and like, hey, did you put these right stampers on? Because sometimes with a double LP, like, oh, shit, I loaded AB instead of C and D. So I try to keep up with that. And if I don't catch it, then that's the inspector's responsibility, because we are very mindful. We have three different people triple checking things all the time because a lot of numbers are easy to get mixed up. And sometimes we catch things that we didn't mess up, but like say the labels get sent to us and there's four tracks on the B side and five on the A, but there's only two tracks listed on the B side. <laughs> so we have to look into it. Like, do they have, is this just a misprint? Are these bonus tracks? So those are some things we have to look out for because we don't always know. 
and sometimes literally it's happened just a to me this week. <laughs> literally this week. No. <laughs> so we, I mean, <laughs> and and we've talked about because like stampers, you have to learn how to uh, you have to learn how to read backwards. Backwards, yeah. So it's I mean sometimes your brain just can't get a, a hold of that. <laughs> oh yeah. Especially because uh, sometimes if they're hand etched. Mm -hmm. somebody might mess up and they just scratch it out turn that a to a b so i'm like is this really a b stamper <laughs> you're welcome on behalf of cutting <laughs> cutting people everywhere you're welcome. oh yeah Appreciate <laughs> it. but it's it's not it's not too bad but that does happen sometimes but. totally does yeah, you, I mean. you said um inspectors have two presses do you have mm -hmm. one press op per press and like do you guys rotate or do you stay with a press uh, it depends because like right now with all the COVID stuff we're shorter some days than not but typically each person is assigned two three tops like two machines yeah. so it's you and Susan and then who's the other person who's the other <laughs> the other one in, in your trio uh, I haven't named that one yet because the owners actually named all of our older SMT presses after yep. um, characters from Sanford and Sons, but <laughs> everybody has just made their own names, and I haven't figured out names for all of the new machines yet, because they <laughs> all have so many weird quirks, but Susan is the bane of my existence, <laughs> and it's even changed numbers from the time that it was put in. It went from four to seven. And it's mm -hmm. cursed. So I'm just like, fuck you, Susan. I don't want to work today. <laughs> when I was working at Precision and doing um, QA, I, I was working on the auto side for a week. And we had four autos at that point. And I just named them after the Golden Girls. And so nice. I was like, Blanche is acting a fool today. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this isn't it. This is not the hotness today. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not good at naming things. So I usually just shout profane things at them <laughs> that's okay i mean it's a factory environment it's loud sometimes you can get away with that stuff oh yeah it's if i could it. figure out where the balls were i'd kick them but <laughs> i have yet to figure that out let's talk about printed stuff let's talk about labels and how labels can uh throw a wrench into the problem like into oh. your pr production aspect and what are all the things that can go wrong with labels? Okay, well, uh, the last couple of weeks, and I think it has something to do with how humid it's been, but some for some reason this past week we've had labels exploding as they press. And why does that happen? We're trying to figure it out because hmm. back in the day with our Hamilton presses, it was due to the labels being overly baked because we have to bake them because of all the ink. We have to bake the moisture out. Because sometimes if they're underbaked, they could have bubbling or the ink on the labels can smear. But overbaking is usually what causes them to explode. And it's just a big mess. And yeah. then that makes us have to clean the stampers because then you've got weird paper residue or an outline of this label in the matrix area. <laughs> and that's one thing we've been trying to work with because as time changes, you know, people are always finding new materials like oh, let's try this ink for these labels. Let's try a glossy finish. And no. that, the machines don't always like that, but we also have to figure out how to make them work with our facility. Cause it could just be that we don't have the oven up high enough and we might need to bake it a little hotter or maybe it's too hot and we need to drop that down a bit. And we're, those are some things that we're trying to work on right now. Yeah, it's so interesting how that can affect it. I mean. And I think that's something a lot of people don't realize, too. I mean, on the front end, when we're talking to people about design, too, we have to mm -hmm. make sure that they realize that's going to happen because, mm -hmm. you know, the ink can change, especially with certain PMS colors that have yeah. a mm -hmm. white balance. You know, it can really shift and then they get it and they're like, this isn't what I wanted. Right. <laughs> so well, This yeah. is what happens after it sits in an oven for 45 minutes. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it's funny how you need to have like a chef for... Yes labels and and things like i got the bag of the labels yeah seriously <laughs> though and you're like oh well these ones these ones stayed in for an extra five minutes and like that might be good for cookies but not good enough for labels <laughs> yeah. like when they start to change colors because they've been in for too long but it's like okay like 
if you've ever seen a lab like a label baker, mm -hmm. it's that that piece of machinery alone is pretty crazy. Like it looks like a big industrial fridge. Oh yeah. And you open these giant doors that are weighted. And then you get uh, yeah, you, you, it's it's oh, like God. you're hoping nobody kicks you in there, like Hansel and Gretel style. Oh my but God, like, a nightmare! I've never thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. And then there's oh. a bunch of like spears that are coming up from the back, so that mm -hmm. you can actually like snake the labels on there because obviously they have a little spindle hole on them. Iron Maiden esque. Yeah. <laughs> Not the band, but the torture device. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, and that, and that's exactly it. Like, it's like, oh, like, you know, it, it, it's almost like, oh, I put these ones in at like 2.15. Okay. Yeah. They need to stick. And like, who does that? <laughs> Whose job is, who becomes that person? Because that would be a nightmare. Oh, it is. Especially when you get in a label order and you haven't gotten one in two, two weeks. It's, yeah. it's a lot. And I give props to our label coordinator. <laughs> I mean, and like, what is the average baking time for a label? Like I how honestly, long do those... I don't know. I we need to talk to that. We need to talk to that person. Next yeah, year. because I know. Because like... I had, that's the only thing I haven't figured out is like, when they get the stampers in, how, how did they etch them? Because they have a weird process and they keep changing it because we number our stampers right now. Like if we get a set of 10, you've got, a1 b1 or a2 b2 and we have someone hand etching our numbers and that's one thing we're trying to stray away from especially when they etch a five backwards or something but <laughs> we're straying away from that because now we are so big that we have so many stampers it's a lot for just a couple of people to put a five on there this is six this is fuck that's 13 okay um <laughs> carry the two yeah this is an a no this is the c oh no but yeah that's that's not a good and time you said your clients are supplying stampers so you guys aren't don't... yeah they they do supply them we are planning when we get our new building we are hoping to cut stampers in house but as of right now we do have the clients but I finally watched, I think it was the Vinyl Me Please video, but they showed the process of it. And then I went back and watched a whole bunch of videos on YouTube. And I was like, why have I just now started looking into this? This is amazing. <laughs> it's, I, it's witchcraft. That's the witch, the witchiest witchcraft of the, of the whole process. It's so true. It's so freaking cool. Like there's just, I learn new stuff every day and it's, it's so mind blowing. Well, that's, I mean, that's, that's the thing. And like, we were, we were just talking with our friend Katie, um, about how many steps and how many processes there are involved in all of this stuff. And it's, it's, it's perfect that you just said that because it's funny how we, some of us are in our little silos and we don't understand all of the other aspects of how these things get made, but we rely on all of those things right. constantly to just be like, all right, well, this has to get done. There's gotta be a competent person there that's doing it, obviously, <laughs> but you don't know what that dude's name is or yeah. who, who, or where things are coming from. And you're like, oh, I, well, you know, the PVC just shows up on the loading dock. So that's great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, stampers get here. That's yep. super. It's uh, it's, I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons that we we wanted to do this podcast so that we can kind of make it a little bit more cohesive and make people understand like, hey, there's room for everybody in all of these like aspects and all of this, all of these processes have, have, you know, room for new people to go in and find, oh, yeah. find their, their role, their jam. Cause if, yeah. Cause if everyone loved their job, like you love your job, imagine yeah. how awesome this industry could be. Like we could totally. be doing all oh kinds of God. cool stuff. Yeah. And that's why I'm, we have a lot of people employed there now that are so passionate about music. I think that's also another reason why I like it so much because yeah. I had a supervisor who his brain was just literally musical knowledge. He would see a label and say, that label was blue in 72. Yes. <laughs> like, I miss him. And That's like, how he Ray is. On. <laughs> yeah. And uh, do you guys know Brian Nickel? I don't think so. Mm -mm. He, he worked there for a really long time, but he had a lot of knowledge about cutting, printing. He knew everything about everything. And I think he actually 
just started working at another plant in like North Carolina or something, but he was a really awesome. cool dude and he taught me a lot of stuff. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. I mean, and that, that, and that's the thing, right? Like going in and, and having somebody that is willing to share the knowledge with you, regardless of your gender, mm-hmm. like that's, that's the best part, right? Like finding somebody that was like, Oh, here, come here, kid. Yeah. Let me, let, me, <laughs> let, me, let me show you the ropes. And you're still like singing his praises and being like, Oh, I miss that dude. And like, mm-hmm. he knows all the stuff. So, yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I'm hoping to be able to impart, you know, in many moons when I decide to hang <laughs> up my old cutting, my old cutter head. But like, yeah. that's, that's the jam, man. Like passing on the love and the knowledge that's, mm-hmm. that's, what's going to make this industry keep being relevant and keep persisting. I think. Yeah. And the owners are very passionate about music too. And almost mm-hmm. everybody there has been in a band. Like, I think they joked at one point that it stand for Memphis retired people or <laughs> retired music people. <laughs> almost everyone that works there is a retired musician or is a mu- <laughs> musician. I mean, it makes such a big difference if you care about the product that you're putting out. Right? Exactly. For sure. And we have a Thanks. lot of people that are very passionate and just care enough. Like yeah. it, it makes a really big difference. So going back to like things that you see on the record when you're pulling it off mm-hmm. and, and looking at it, like what are some common flaws that you see that might be audible? And what are the things that you see that aren't audible that people should get down off their high audio file horses about and just be like, listen here, bro. It doesn't <laughs> actually make a difference. So there are heating issues. There are cooling issues. There are label issues. So a label can be pressed off center. So where the center hole of the label is, where your the pin of the turntable goes, that hole could be off center. So that's something that can happen. We can fix that. Um, there's the stitching that I mentioned from when it's too cold. Um, there's something that we call non-fill and that's, it's kind of a form of stitching, but it's too hot. So it, we're still trying to figure it out, but it's one of the biggest problems we have. So the grooves literally aren't getting filled in, but if you look at it under a microscope, it looks like stitching, like the material just got ripped from the groove. So you've got this weird gap on your record, but we usually fix that by making things either hotter or colder. It just depends on the grooves um there's also something called mad edge or glazing so it makes the lead in of the record it's basically from it being too hot and overcooking it and it gets kind of a spongy texture on the lead end of the record um so we can fix that by cooling it and that usually makes like a sound Hmm. um yes there are some things like if a a stamper is cut like we've got the mother sometimes I've seen that the mothers have like fine hairline scratches on them so all of our stampers will have a similar pattern of scratches like a lot of our older MRP jobs like Wu-Tang or Tribe Called Quest like a lot of those stampers had scratches on the mothers so we always have scratches on those but they're never audible yeah and sometimes if we do find that they are audible we have to get them recut yep I'm trying to think what about veil veil yeah. What is that? I don't know what that is. So, um, like there's blue veil and it's kind of like when a record has like a sheen of a color on it, like it, it's almost like a blue sheen. Oh, I know over. what you're talking it, about. It only usually color. ever happens on like black records, but. We do have it happen a lot with certain color blends, like white compound. Yeah. It turns the stampers blue and it makes it look kind of hazy. So I call it more of a tarnishing, but we don't really have a term for that. But okay. I've noticed that white compound just wrecks the stampers. Like it'll turn them blue. And sometimes if we clean it, it won't come off. So we have to change the stampers again. But most of the time it'll oh. clean off just fine. We use Brasso. Jen, do you find that in, at first too? Have you noticed any new ha- from white? I haven't noticed that now, but oh. Ray may have the yeah. things that they're doing. I'll have to ask. I mean, it, yeah, that's an that's a interesting uh, like press to press thing. For sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we. Yeah. I didn't have a name for it, but I like that. A veil. I like yeah. that. <laughs> but that does happen, and we just we just clean them because sometimes it can't give it a higher noise floor. How long do you feel? Um, because I know it can vary from 
plant to plant, but how many records do you typically feel you can get off a stamper? Uh, we used to have a lifespan of 2000 good presses, um, but that was on our older machines and the hydraulics were a lot different than the autos we have now. Um, so typically we can get between like four and 6,000 good presses from it. But sometimes like the center of the stamper can blow. So we might blow through it a little sooner. That can happen from people over tightening when they install it. Right. Um, but typically we can get like, I'd say 4,000 is a good average. Nice. But I have seen them. I myself have put a stamper on that made like 8,000, but that's Whoa. crazy. We had a really big job and it, it, it held up pretty well. I think I did a pretty good job there. <laughs> <laughs> like I'll pat myself on the back for that one. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. That's some like finite smashing right there. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And they still sounded good too. I think the only reason we had to change it was it, I think the job ended or it had a blown edge or something. Yeah. <laughs> but I did a pretty good job. That's right. <laughs> so one of the things that we talked about um, in the last episode that we recorded was um, how turn times in the pandemic have, have affected things, but that we can essentially oh. only press as many records as the machine will be able to do. What is your output? However you want to share. Is it like so many records a day or like how does that sort of work? So... The way we have it set up, we have certain jobs scheduled on certain presses because we've got presses that have 140 gram molds that are gonna run 140 gram jobs or we have presses with 180 gram molds that'll run jobs for that. So we have someone putting certain jobs on the schedule accordingly. Um, and I just totally lost train of thought. I'm I so think tired. That... I didn't sleep much last night. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think that's, I think it's important though to mention that you have to have different molds for yeah. 140 versus 180. I don't think people really understand that either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to set up the machine different for, for a different record. I mean, mm -hmm. you guys do, do you do sevens and twelves there too? Uh, no, we just, we used to way back in the day, but we don't anymore. So just twelves? Yes. So, and, I mean, and, and that's the other thing, right? Like what, when you start getting into different sizes, then you've got to, you have a whole another set of variables as well. Mm -hmm. so. And I have, I don't, I was never around to see them do the sevens, but I have found a couple of old stampers. They're so cute, <laughs> but I never did get to see those. Sevens, um, seven inch records are the cutest records. So yes. Yeah. Um, but as far as like press to press, it just depends on the job size. So it can run, a certain job can run on there for three days. It all depends on cycle time, really. So typically we can make a record and I've noticed the cycle time's about 23 seconds. We try mm -hmm. to get it to like 20-ish, but I'm noticing an average of like 23 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, so if we have a job order of a thousand, we can usually finish that up in about a shift sometimes going into a second shift but we typically get between 700 and a thousand presses off of each press and by having 12 presses we shoot for like 10,000 a shift and yeah. so with that how many jobs will be on different presses um it just depends at a given time it depends. A lot of variables come into play if we have all the media for a job, because sometimes we have the stampers, but not the labels. So we might have to shuffle things around. Like right now, our schedule's pretty full up. Like we've got one press that has like eight jobs lined up, but we also have a bunch on hold. So yeah. stuff that we haven't quite gotten ready for, but it, it changes every single day. And some things happen, like we might run out of stampers and have to order more. So right. we have to put something on hold or we ran out of labels or a, a lot of things could go into play there. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a lot. There's so yes. much going on. <laughs> yes. It's so true. I mean, and all of those things are dependent on like shipping and communication and- Oh yeah, like our- packaging department was so far behind a couple of months ago because we had so many shipments that were delayed from COVID issues. Yeah. So 
we were putting out so many records because we had plenty of stuff to do, but we didn't have all the media to put jobs together. Right. So we, they were slim pickings for jobs, but now we've gotten lots of shipments in and now they can't keep up. It's like right. we've yes. been putting re records out, making them consistently. We just haven't been able to package and assemble them and send them out. But now mm -hmm. they're finally getting caught back up because all of the deliveries and stuff are finally kind of leveling out. I mean, and it's not the easiest thing to put a record in a sleeve and a sleeve in a jacket sometimes. Sometimes the folding and the gluing, like the way oh, the, yeah. the, those edges are, like mm -hmm. that is, it's not a one, a one shot deal. It's for not like, the easiest. For OB spines. Yes. Or box mm -hmm. sets <laughs> shrink, oh, yeah. shrink wrapping like that shrink wrap machine i mean that that had that should have been an uh, like an episode of dexter anyway like somebody <laughs> going through the shrink oh, yeah. machine Ooh, for sure you. but like that's like that that machine i think is an underrated piece of technology too like that oh yeah does, does like, some serious business Ooh, yeah try to shrink wrapper it. guy yeah he's a yeah. wizard yeah <laughs> yes they've got to be yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like, like I feel like we gotta we gotta shout out all the packaging departments because those those guys like Death by a Thousand Paper Cuts. You guys are oh yeah doing the Lord's Ooh. work right there. Cardboard <laughs> cuts too. Oh, yeah. those are the yeah. worst. Ugh, those are <laughs> thick. That I mean, that's a resounding cringe through everybody. Everybody yeah. has <laughs> has opened a box and like got a, a cardboard cut or like a. a I, mm. my palms are sweating just thinking about ah, it like, yeah no 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 okay no okay <laughs> so when you see those kind of like errors in um like that are coming in off the press like stitching and things like that you like you're saying you're playing with the settings with with like heating and cooling when you make adjustments like that how responsive are the machines like are you seeing adjustments happen and correct in like a few copies like is there something that really like shuts you down where you're like oh i just you know hard reset like control alt delete <laughs> start this machine all over again um no it's usually pretty instant um because awesome. you've got the cycle time from start to finish and if you adjust like right in the middle of uh, a cycle the mm -hmm. next cycle will apply that set that setting okay. so that next record I usually let it press two or three more to get a really good reading, but it's almost immediate. If it won't change if it's in the middle of a cycle, but the next cycle it will apply that. So it usually gives us a pretty good reading right away, like if we're making the correct adjustment in the right direction or if we need to do something different. Right. And do you guys typically run on white label until you get to the right, like, okay, yes. this is approved and then, yeah. Yes, that's one thing that we are trained to do because we have had stuff happen where the stampers like or an operator could load the same stamper on both sides. So it's got two B stampers on there. And especially if we change a color, we want to make sure we have the settings dialed in because yeah. if we because sometimes if it's not hot enough, it won't even fill out the stamper completely. And it's like a cold press. So it's just you can't even see the grooves on it. It's just this hard <laughs> flab of plastic. So by using white labels, we're not wasting the media that's been sent to us because we only are given a certain amount for that job. So we, yeah. uh, our autos can actually run without labels. So we either run it without or we do have just junk white or black labels that we run on there till we know that it's good. Awesome. Interesting. Yeah. What's your relationship like with QC, especially because you used to work in the QC department? Are you still homies with all those guys? And Oh, yeah. We yeah. are constantly talking with each other. Yeah. And sometimes we'll have like a stamper dimple out and they're like, I don't think we should pass these. And I'm like, I don't either. So we help <laughs> make decisions on what we yeah. think should be sent out into the world. Right. So we we communicate throughout the day and they'll always tell me because we for each shift we have two QC guys. Yeah. Um, so they split up the machines and they listen to everything throughout the day. But we're constantly communicating with each other like, hey, I've been hearing some of this on this press. Can you adjust for warping on this one? Uh, they they keep in, in contact with us throughout the whole shift. Oh, that's awesome. And the inspectors do too. Are you guys running like three shifts like full, full, full? Or is it like a your overnight is like a few less people? Um, first shift definitely has the most people. 
Yeah. My ship, we have like 20 some odd people, but that's only on the production side. There's also like 15 people on the packaging side. The packaging only runs first and second shift, but yeah. third shift definitely has the least amount of people because, you know, all the, all the CSRs and everything are there during the day on first shift. So third shift is literally just production. First shift and second shift is production and packaging and assembly. So there's a lot more people during the day than there are at night. And we run Monday through Friday. So third shift starts Sunday night at 1130. Right. Wow. And how are you guys running 10% overs on your... I think that's another thing I have to explain to people all the time is overs and yes. unders. Yeah. Yes. So um, maybe, yeah, talk about that, how, how much you guys run. Um, so... A common what's your order minimum? size. Yeah, what's your minimum? They've, it's changed because I've seen us do something as minimum as 200. Okay. But we have also done orders as big as like 30,000, like a 30,000 piece double LP no. or something. We're starting to get more of those. Right, Elton John? I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> but we've done we've done a lot of soundtracks and those get put out a lot. Like Kendrick Lamar's Damn, we've put out we've made so many Kendrick Lamar albums. <laughs> but typically for an order, yes, we do press 10% overs. So like if we have an order of 1000, we make 100 overs. Yeah. And like right now, we have so many big orders that we're having to break them down into parts. So we'll have like an order of 60,000 broken into two parts. So we've got part one, part two. So if we're breaking them down into parts, we don't always do overs until the last, the last part oh, of it, fine. because until we're completely done pressing it is when we'll really do the overs. So if it's like right. a 500 piece, we usually do 50 overs and we also do client samples. So I think we have, we keep some for our archive and then the client will request special copies to get sent before the pressing is complete. So we go ahead and get some together and send them to them so they can see what the final product looks like before we're actually done pressing it and send it out. It's chaos and I love yeah. the chaos. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, something we were just talking about too, is how, you know, on those huge jobs, a lot of people think that um, they're pushing some of the indies and bands out of the way, but actually like a lot of plants are putting them on certain presses or like a couple presses and we have mm -hmm. other presses to be able to put all of the other right. jobs on. So like this past week, like there's a soundtrack on this press, there's a double LP on these two presses. So you've got A, B, C, D here. We've got two versions of the same job running. This one's in this color, this one's in this color. It, it varies and we're always running new stuff yeah. and that's one thing i miss about qc is being able to listen to all that new stuff because now i'm just so busy being on the floor making sure everything is getting done correctly that i don't always have time to listen to it but i got to listen to so much cool new music being in qc like things that i would never listen to that i loved that's one thing that i miss but yeah. i could easily we have so many turntables in our warehouse i could easily sit down and listen but I just can't stop moving. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah. yeah. Press ops are busy, busy, busy humans, man. Mm -hmm. Have you had a lot of experience with the manual press? No. no. They, we have a couple of people that run them. Yeah. Um, but at the time, they basically told me I was too essential on the other presses that they didn't want me over there. Because when you're on a manual, that's, that's pretty much your hole. Because yeah. whoever is running a manual press can press it, inspect it and do both at the same time. Whereas the autos, you've got one to operate, one to inspect. Right. So they needed me keeping up with everything else. So I have run it before, yeah. but not near enough. And I'm really excited because we're about to get a machine that we can do picture discs on. So that's what I'm super stoked about. Yeah. And um, are you gonna, is it just like a 12 inch picture disc machine yes. that you're gonna? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm excited because we tried okay. to do it with the, the uh, manuals we have now, yeah. but it's not equipped for it. Like it just wouldn't happen. Like they sent <laughs> us some sample materials yeah. and it, it did look cool, but it wasn't 
quite right. Like it would not have played, it would not have done what it was supposed to do. So we're like, okay, well, we'll invest in something later. But hey, that looks cool. <laughs> <laughs> nice right. try. One yeah. The wall. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so what is your guys' uh, typical turnaround time right now? We know it's um going to be long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't try and impress us. But I mean, I'm more impressed now if it's like August of 2022. I'm like, oh, good. Uh, I think someone was actually just telling me this the other day, and I think it's like six to eight months, maybe. Um, COVID really kind of hit us in the stomach on that. Like a lot of things we're pressing now are due next week. But a lot of it is also big orders getting chopped up into several so that we can send partial amounts of an order. Right once it's already due but then keep going and do a little bit of this here do a little bit of this here we'll go back to that next week we'll send some more of that out (laughs) we're doing a whole lot of shuffling right now it's it's a it's a pretty tough time right now but we're making it work by golly (laughs) we're making it work that's industry wide right now you Mm -hmm. know like it's you guys aren't the only ones so that's that's for sure so take solace in that yeah we'll do thank you (laughs) i forget (laughs) <laughs> yeah. you're not the only plant brianna don't worry <laughs> yeah, because we're even we've actually worked some overtime on the weekends to try to pick up some of the slack but we're finally getting back into the green and out of the red so we're doing a good job that's great, that's great. yeah that's great i mean memphis turns out some great records so it's uh i mean you guys are obviously doing doing something right yeah something you're, you're making another building yeah it's a little, a little what it's like the little silicon valley of, of memphis but. i know it's just been this open field and they've talked about it since i can remember but now they're they've actually already broken ground and like are, there's little flags in the field and i'm like this is really happening i'm so That's excited awesome. That's so great. no it's, i mean i i love how excited you are about it it's so good because nice i've I've seen them start in the one building that we have our warehouse in. That's where everything was. We had packaging and assembly in that building. We had half of the presses we have now. And I've seen them expand so much, but like this is so much bigger than anything they've ever done. And it's just really exciting to be a part of it because it's, it's going to be crazy. Like I never thought that they would get to this point. And they even said like, this was not our plan, but it's happening and we're doing it. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's awesome. So Memphis for life, huh? Oh yeah. So I don't know if you've listened to the podcast before, Brianna, but we have a question that we try to ask all the time. Oh no, no, I don't. (laughs) I should. No, it's all good. You're gonna, you're gonna do great. I can't wait for your answer. Okay. If you could create a custom seven-inch record, Hmm. anybody on the A side from any time, any label, and anybody you want on the B side what would be your custom seven inch record oh my gosh i love the way i love it when we get them with no preparation (laughs) yeah (laughs) because i listen to a lot of different music as you should because i would probably want something like jefferson airplane on one side oh now we're yeah we're doing it we're here for it and then on the other side there's an artist i listen to called truth it's like super deep underground dubstep music so they're completely different but i feel like that would be a really good a really cool mix love that that's great i love it totally different uh, grace slick would love that yeah i know she would (laughs) know it that's awesome (laughs) well i hope this wasn't too painful (laughs) oh no i i've just never I've never actually had the time to sit and talk with somebody about it so much. Cause most people, if I explain the process, they're like, so what's the chain of command like? I'm like, why is that what you're worried about? I'm trying to tell you <laughs> how a record is made and you don't, you're not asking the right questions. So it's cool to actually be able to talk with it or talk about it with people who know what I'm talking about. It was really cool. Awesome. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's awesome to have somebody that's so knowledgeable about all of the processes and have, have done so many things in multiple departments to be able to talk about it. It's, I mean, I think part of the, the hesitancy of women and non-binary folks to get into factory jobs specifically is, is that kind of like mis like misunderstanding of like what you're actually going to be doing, like, hmm. 
yeah, I mean, sometimes you got to lift, you know, something that's like maybe 50 pounds. It's like a bag of compound or something, but it's Hell not, yeah. you know what I mean? Like you're not, you're not bench pressing something that's gigantic or, I mean, there's like a lot of people around to help you out, but oh, yeah. I mean, if there's one thing that you could say about like getting more people to Memphis, like more, more women press ops, like what would be, what would be your selling, your selling, uh, pitch? Why, why should there be more chicks that jump into Memphis? Small hands. There you go. (laughs) Small hands. And also organization and cleanliness. Like guys are so sloppy and there you go doing our job you have to be very precise and neat and granted sound better exactly and there are men who are very capable but like the women who i've worked with who have been operators have been some of the best operators like i don't know if it's the way our brains are wired like i don't know but we do a really good job we can do the same thing that any guy can do if not better and There's just something about it. I don't, I don't know. It just suits us somehow. Like one of my coworkers, Brittany, she's, she's a kick-ass operator and having small hands with these autos, it's so easy to get your hands into a press of a bolt falling down or something like <laughs> good stuff. Small hands is probably my selling point. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I, I love it. Whatever, whatever the gateway is for us to like make people understand that there, that there's room for everybody in all of these places. Like, Oh yeah. yeah, that's that's the thing, man. We're we're able to fish hook them with our tiny digits. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go after it. It's great. I love it. Yeah, like our this the place I work. There's it's such a melting pot of different people, yep. and we're all so dysfunctional, but we all get along. Like we put the fun in dysfunction, yeah. and it <laughs> it's definitely like an island of misfits and everybody gets along and we're all so weird in our own way but it it just works well thank you very much for your time brianna we yeah, really appreciate you. you taking part of your day off from your crazy schedule <laughs> to be able to uh, talk with us about being a press op well thank because, you yeah. for having me i i told you oh. i'm awkward and i hope i wasn't too awkward but you didn't hey, seem like I... it at all <laughs> no you're good don't worry you're that that was that was easy yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, hope I did answer the questions like to the yeah. best of my abilities. I, yeah. I don't think I did, but I hope you. Yeah, that was great. Did. There is no reason for you to apologize or have any doubt, my friend. Okay, cool. You smashed. You smashed it. Just like you, you smashed. Hey. Boxes. You're good. <laughs> Smash don't, day. don't you worry. Yeah, no, that was that was awesome, and I I know that we'll have like. I know we'll have people that have more questions about press operating because it's, I mean, this has been the first time that I think anybody has actually talked to an actual operator and explained a little bit of the in and out of it. So we might have follow-ups. Glad I got some popcorn cherry. I'll be here to answer any more questions. Try the veal. We'll be here all week. That's great. I love it. So that is episode 13 with the lovely and talented Brianna Orozco from Memphis Record Pressing. Uh, we also want to say thank you to Normandy Records and Gabriella Triste for the use of her song, Fruitsy. Get ready. It's going to get stuck in your head for days. It's such a good little jam. So much fun. The Women in Vinyl store is live now at womeninvinyl.com slash store. You know where it is. Get yourself a record cleaning kit and clean up those records. Your mother would be ashamed of you. As always, join in the conversation on Instagram or send us a note at media at womeninvinyl.com. Check out the website for the blog for all the interviews and all the old episodes. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Give us a review, please, on your favorite podcast delivery method. You can also contribute to our mission at patreon.com slash women in vinyl. Give us your money. Help us give your money to other people that need your money. We have a fantastic podcast sponsor alert. We want to send a huge thank you out to other record labels. They've gifted us and our listeners, that's you, a 50% discount code. That's WIV50 in their store for the myriad of resources that Scott has compiled there. Please go to 
www.otherrecordlabels.com slash store code WIV50 at checkout to start your own record label and join the madness. Get into the chaos, you guys. Come join the chaos. As always, you'll find the B-sides, the deep cuts, the amazing extras, and help us start a not-for-profit for the demystification, education, and infiltration of more women and non-binary identifying humans into the vinyl making space at www.patreon.com slash women in vinyl. That's patreon.com slash women in vinyl. Thanks, you guys. Keep it analog. Have a great week. This episode has been brought to you by Women in Vinyl and Red Spade Records. Thank you for listening. Please remember to subscribe. And you can always contact us directly by visiting www.womeninvinyl.com.